guess we're about to go live. Hi, everybody. This is Carrie Mills from Tuesday Talks from the Gordon Jewish Community Center. Although I am from home right now because we're not fully back, but almost we're 99% back. So that's exciting. And um, today we have a great show, not show, talk, talk show. Well, it's going to be kind of a talk and show. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to introduce you today to our to our speaker. Uh, before that, just um, if you have any questions, feel free to put them uh, into um, uh, YouTube and Alex can uh, transfer them to me so we can answer questions if you have any. And, and um, what else do I need to know? I guess that's it. So just um, let me start by introducing our guest, Ms. Tara Mil, Mil oh my gosh, Milnick. I Mil was gonna, uh, Melnick, sorry. <laughs> just asked her because I saw IE and I was, so it's Melnick, okay. Tara Melnick. So ta Dr. Tara Melnick, Dr. Tara Mitchell Melnick be began teaching history courses at Cumberland University, first as an adjunct in 2013, and then as full-time faculty in 2017. Her areas of emphasis include public history and 20th century American history, with specific research interest in the built environment, the home front, of, the home front in World War I, and the Depression in New, in the New, De and, and New Deal. Courses that she offers at Cumberland include Emergence of Modern America, Environmental History, Introduction to Public History, Museum Studies, American Crime, Urban and Suburban History, and American Sports History, among others. We're going to have to get you back for American Crime because our audience loves crime. I have <laughs> that was to one of my favorite classes, for sure. <laughs> but I'm telling you, it's, it's also with us, we noticed. Okay. Prior to coming to, coming to Cumberland, Dr. Melnick was a historic preservation specialist with the Metropolitan Natural Historical Commission for 15 years. Boy, that's a discussion in itself, what's happening in Nashville. Oh my gosh, but okay, wait, I'll, I'll try to get through this without putting in my personal comments, which everybody knows I do anyway. And served previously at the Tennessee Historical Commission and the South Carolina Department of Archives and History. She currently serves on the Tennessee State Review Board for the National Register of Historic Places. Dr. Melnick combined work in historic preservation, New Deal history, and environmental history with her book, New Deal, New Landscape, the Civilian Conservation Corps in, Corp in South Carolina State Parks, and which is from the University of South Carolina Press, and is a contributor in, the ten in Tennessee's experience in World War I from the University of Tennessee Press and the Tennessee Encyclopedia. She's currently working on a book manuscript tracing the history of Nashville's Sunnyside Mansion under contract with Vanderbilt University Press. Very impressive. Wow. <laughs> makes me, I thought I was busy, but that makes me look like <laughs> doing anything. So, and, and I'll just give you a little synopsis of what um, Dr. Melnick is going to speak about today. In the Depression decade of the 1930s, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal very, very literally changed the landscape of the United States through programs like the Works Progress Administration, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the Public Works Administration, and the Tennessee Valley Authority. Dr. Tara Mitchell Milnick will lead a virtual tour through some of the best known and lesser known New Deal building projects in Davidson County to demonstrate the lasting effect the New Deal has had on our built environment. This is gonna be fascinating. So I'm just gonna take it away. I'm gonna say, take it away, Tara Melnick. Doctor. Tara Mitchell Melnick. <laughs> well, thank you, Carrie, and thank you, Alex, for all of your technical help a little bit earlier as well. And I really appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to speak with you all today. And I can't um, let this go by, but I also have to say thank you to my friend Harriet Shirley, who is probably the person that put me in touch with you all. So I really, really do appreciate all of your all's interest. And I hope this is an interesting program for you all. I'm going to try to share my screen here. This is when I talk or teach, I like to have pretty pictures. So people are looking at something besides me. So let's see. All right, Zoom and PowerPoint don't want to play nicely together. Hang on. How's that? Carrie, is that good? Okay. 
Yes, that's good. I had my sound turned off. So no, no, that's okay. I could see you nodding. So I was like, I think that means okay. So yeah. um, this, this is a talk that really comes out of a lot of my work with the Metropolitan Historical Commission. Again, I spent nearly 15 years there. Um, I like to say that I probably drove on every road in Davidson County over that time um, doing survey work and things like that. But uh, my interest really is in the New Deal decade. Um, Carrie talked about my book manuscript that I'm working on for Vanderbilt, but I also would really like to eventually write, write this book someday. So you're gonna, gonna get a preview of what I'd like to write about. So, but although Tennessee and Nashville received, a, received assistance through a number of Franklin Roosevelt's alphabet soup programs of the New Deal, things like Social Security, the National Recovery Agency, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, and many others, some of the most visible are through um, these programs that I wanna talk about today. Um, these programs that changed not just our landscape in Nashville and Middle Tennessee, but all over the state and really all over the nation. Um, programs like the Civil Works Administration, the Civilian Cons Conservation Corps, the Works Progress Administration, the Public Works Administration, and of course the Tennessee Valley Authority. When we talk about the New Deal, especially in the 21st century, its legacy and its success really continue to be debated. But one thing we can't disagree on is the fact that its architectural legacy definitely left a lasting mark, particularly for those of us who live in Middle Tennessee and Nashville. Um, this architectural legacy also impacted everyday men and women who found employment and economic relief through these various New Deal programs. And these buildings are a visual reminder of that time in our history, almost 100 years ago now. When I started working on the New Deal, it was just kind of celebrating its 75th anniversary. So I'm beginning to really feel my age when we talk about the centennial coming up. But in Nashville in particular, the New Deal provided some of our most notable landmarks, recreational facilities, tourist attractions, schools, and office space that many people still work in. In Tennessee, one of the earliest New Deal programs was that of the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, or FERA, and in Tennessee, the Tennessee Emergency Relief Administration, or TERA. These are you know, very similar names, obviously. Um, these programs would eventually become the basis of the Works Progress Administration, or the WPA. Initially, these programs were invented to provide work relief. Um, the Emergency Relief Act, passed during Franklin Roosevelt's first 100 days, provided state grants to provide jobs for unemployed and underemployed people. Um, the, the federal government required states to match the money, but the percentage of that match varied widely from state to state. Um, these pictures are just two of the very early New Deal projects in Tennessee, um, things like sewing projects to provide work for women in particular, but also to provide clothing for needy families and their children. Um, in Clinton, Tennessee, the Terra program also funded the construction of the Green McAdoo School up in Clinton. In Nashville, the Terra projects included the building of the what we call the original John Early School in North Nashville, um, the beginning of the construction of Stokes School on Belmont Boulevard, and additions to what was then called the Cumberland High School in Bordeaux in 1934. Um, in Tennessee, the Terra Safety Department also prepared canvas first aid kits distributed at Trimble School. And again, this is a job that was designed to employ women to put to sew up these kits and um, fill them with first aid supplies. Another program was that of the Civil Works Administration. And again, this is a federal organization designed to administer work relief. This was planned as a temporary program to assist families while the government was working on larger scale programs, things like the Public Works Administration. Indeed, the CWA was basically a Band-Aid on a much larger pro problem while they were doing the planning for these larger programs like the WPA and the PWA. Um, the CWA actually only lasted for four months in 1933, but during that time, it employed nearly 60,000 people in Tennessee. 
over 1,100 projects were undertaken in Tennessee alone, including building repair for schools, roads, other public buildings, and these jobs for women under things like that had been prepared under the Terra program, things like sewing rooms, clerical work, school lunch programs, and teaching were also, was also funded under the CWA. East High School, which is a true East Nashville landmark, was constructed prior to the New Deal, um, early in the decade of the 1930s. But it did receive CWA funding after it was damaged by a tornado in its first year of operation. Local architect George Waller supervised the CWA reconstruction and repairs to East Nashville High School. And because of tornado damage at another Nashville school, Bailey Junior High School, um, the junior high students from Bailey were also moved to East High School and a junior high school was also constructed adjacent to the high school in 19, by 1937. The Works Progress Administration is probably one of the best known of the New Deal programs. In Tennessee, it was administered by Colonel Harry S. Berry, and you'll hear his name a lot in Nashville. Vanderbilt historian Don Doyle said that, quote, Nashville became one of the country's leading recipients of WPA funds, and it was through this program that the New Deal left its most impressive marks on the city. So the WPA was, again, a work relief program designed to provide employment for the unemployed, often semi-skilled workers who could not find other employment and who were on the relief rolls in the state. Construction was only one part of the WPA. Artists, writers, historians, archivists, teachers, musicians, playwrights, actors, and many others also found work through the programs of the WPA. In Tennessee, the WPA continued the work of the CWA through the school lunch program. And by March, 1936, over one and a quarter million hot lunches had been prepared for Tennessee students. And remember, this is the depression decade. For many of these children, this was probably the only meal they ate that day. The school lunch program had an unanticipated benefit in that it brought many more children, particularly in rural counties, into public schools because they were getting food. And so many of these rural children who had not been receiving great educations were now beginning to be enrolled in public schools in their rural counties. Other WPA programs in Tennessee included children's health initiatives, libraries, bookmobiles, recreational instruction, such as swimming, golf, or fishing, arts and crafts instruction, particularly in Centennial Park in Nashville, and dramatic performances, such as this slide here representing the play Power, a, a play about the development of the Tennessee Valley Authority. Another WPA program included a traveling circus that entertained families across the nation. One of the WPA programs put to work in Tennessee was the development of very famous posters under the WPA art project, including this one that advertised the Great Smoky Mountains National Park which was in turn developed by another CCC program or another New Deal program, the Civilian Conservation Corps or the CCC. These posters have become collector's items and reprints have made lots of people a lot of money. Most recently they were included as a series of postage stamps and I bought those and framed them for my office. The CWA and the WPA, in cooperation with the Smithsonian Institution, had provided for archaeological work as well in Tennessee, first at Shiloh Military Park, where both Native Americans and Civil War artifacts were uncovered in 1933. Other archaeological work across the state included this archaeological dig in Bradley County, as well as the Gray Fossil Site up in East Tennessee. Many of the archaeological sites studied by the archaeologists with the TVA and the WPA are now underwater through some of the TVA programs. 
But in Nashville, the WPA's most lasting and visible legacy is found in Nashville parks and to a lesser extent in Nashville schools. In Nashville, the WPA worked on several of our parks, including Fort Negley, Elizabeth Park, Dudley Park, where the WPA constructed a community center and a gymnasium from recycled materials at each of the parks, Buena Vista Springs Park, Coleman Park, which was dedicated to, donated to the city in 1935 and initially developed by the WPA, Douglas Park, Elmington Park, Hadley Park, which was developed as a segregated park specifically for African Americans, Howell Park, which no longer exists, it was on Rutledge Hill, McCabe Park and Golf Course, South Park, of course the Warner Parks, which I'll talk a little more about, and Watkins Park. Now the Warner Parks in Nashville were already under development by the city. But the depression had halted any city funded work of Warner Parks and all of Nashville's new park system. At Warner Parks, the Bellmead entrance designed by Nashville architect Edwin Doherty and landscape architect Bryant Fleming had already been designed, but the multi acreage parks were largely undeveloped. In 1936, the WPA brought in 300 local men to serve as laborers and they worked on the park constructing the golf course, roads and paths through the park, picnic shelters, scout lodges, retaining walls, entry gates at other points, including the ones on Old Hickory Boulevard, and the steeplechase course, which became a highly controversial project. Sometimes people say, well, why was the steeplechase so controversial? But if you think about the idea of the New Deal is to provide for the poor, the unemployed, and we're building a steeplechase park for horse owners, horse racers, horse breeders, who typically weren't in that category of poor and unemployed. So it, there was a lot of questions about the use of the funding for the steeplechase. Other parks include Buena Vista Springs, which was developed in 1934 by a 200 man transient camp basically hobos and homeless men um, who were gathered up through the Tennessee Transient Bureau and the WPA and brought to this North Nashville area to develop a small park. This is a kind of an underknown park in Nashville because most of the park later became the athletic fields for what was then North High School in Nashville or North Nashville High School. Um, that site is now where the um, new John Early Middle School is located. The WPA also developed a park and golf course on the site of the former McConnell Field, which had served as Nashville's airstrip through the 1920s. And this is now known as McCabe Park and McCabe Golf Course. In Centennial Park, the WPA constructed a bathhouse and swimming pool. Um, initially constructed in the 1930s, this pool was closed in the 1950s and 60s during the civil rights movements. Um, the city of Nashville chose to close their pools rather than integrate them during those decades. Um, that's not unusual to Nashville. That's what many Southern communities did. Um, and in 1972, the bathhouse was converted into the Centennial Park Art Center and the pool was converted into the sunken sculpture gardens. They are still in Centennial Park today, so you can still go over to the Parthenon and then go over and see the Centennial Park bathhouse and pool. To me, one of the most notable parks in Nashville that the WPA worked on was a historic preservation project, a reconstruction project at the Civil War Fort Negley. The WPA worked on a variety of historic preservation projects throughout the country, including Cades Cove in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and here in Nashville at Fort Negley. Um, the WPA was joined at Fort Negley by the National Youth Administration, where teenagers were put to work building ball fields and a playground at Fort Negley. Um, during the movement move of the sounds from the, the 
Greer Stadium next to Fort Negley, there was a lot of talk about the redevelopment still being talked about. Um, but there is historic precedent for baseball fields adjacent to Fort Negley because they were built there during the 1930s as well. The WPA and their supervisors studied the original plans for the Civil War fort. And the WPA workers reconstructed stone walls and the wooden palisade within the star-shaped fort. This reconstruction was completed in 1940 and reopened as a historic site. But after the infusion of funds and labor provided by the New Deal, very little was done in the ne next decades after the 40s. Um, there's a lot of questions about why Fort Negley was allowed to continue to deteriorate for 50, 60 years. In part, this is just me thinking out loud, but in part, I think because this fort was associated with the Union Army in a southern town, and particularly in the decades of the 50s and 60s and on into the late 20th century, that was not something that many Southerners wanted to celebrate or preserve, is the fact that Nashville had fallen very early in the war to the Union Army. Fort Negley now is primarily a historic site featuring the ruins of the WPA restoration, as well as what was left after the Civil War, but tells an outstanding story of the Civil War in Nashville, in particular of the African American troops and the African American laborers who worked to build the fort. If you have not been over to Fort Negley and taken the African American history tour, I strongly suggest you do that. Um, I just took a group of students there a couple of weeks ago and we had a really wonderful time. And Krista Castillo there does a great job. Um, this is not really a Nashville park. Um, it is actually in private hands now, but Marrowbone Lake up in the Jolton area is a state managed recreational lake created by the WPA. Initially, the state WPA director, Harry Berry, designed to create up to 100 recreational lakes all over the state of Tennessee. Um, smaller lakes, I think when we think of recreational lakes, we think of Percy Priest or Old Hickory, but these were just to be very small kinds of recreational lakes across the state. Um, again, this is to provide jobs for unemployed men. So clearing the land, digging the lake, damming creeks, streams, and small rivers to create these lakes. This didn't cost a lot of money and materials. This was really put to provide jobs and let for laborers. Very labor intensive, putting lots of people to work, very low cost in materials. But a change in federal policy in the mid 1930s prohibited earthen dams for these recreational lakes. And so they were not gonna be allowed to use just materials on site, they would have to use concrete. And this cost more money, obviously. And so this idea for this series of lakes across the state didn't happen. One historian, James Buren, estimates that only about a dozen of these lakes were created, but Davidson County has one of them up at Marabone Lake. Other than parks, the WPA really left a visual legacy in our schools across Davidson County. And this is where sometimes the New Deal gets really confusing because both the Works Progress Administration and the Public Works Administration built schools across the nation. So we have both the WPA and the PWA. Um, my friend and historian Trina Binkley has distinguished these programs in Davidson County by stating that for the most part, the PWA built Nashville City Schools and the WPA built Davidson County Schools. Of course, once Metro consolidation happened in the 1960s, the school systems were also combined. And so that leads to some more modern confusion about the school systems in Nashville. Approximately $2 million um, was set aside by the WPA to build schools in Nashville in 1936 alone. So that's just one year of the New Deal. And you can think about what $2 million would have looked like to the city schools in the middle of the Great Depression. So the WPA finishes up projects that had been begun under the CWA and under TERA um, and, and worked on schools um, in 32 locations, including 
many famous Nashville schools um, that are still in existence today. Caldwell, Carter Lawrence, Bailey, Cameron, Howard, Cockrell. Um, they worked at the North Nashville High School, which is now the location of John Early. They worked at Highland Heights and they constructed This is Stokes School on Belmont Boulevard. Um, completed by the WPA in the mid-1930s and had later additions in the 1950s. The WPA also worked at Tennessee State University, um, constructing Hale Stadium and the Fieldhouse at Tennessee State University, as well as a great deal of the campus landscaping and um, hand-laid stone walls on campus at TSU. Again, just similar enough to be confusing. So if you're, if you're taking notes that we are shifting to the PWA instead of the WPA, it gets really confusing, it's fine. Um, the Public Works Administration also worked on a large number of architectural projects across Davidson County and especially in Nashville. Um, the PWA functioned a lot like the WPA, although its projects were typically much larger in scale and the PWA worked with more skilled construction workers, where the PWA was often for semi-skilled and unskilled workers. The PWA was really looking for skilled architects and engineers, as well as um, masons, stone masons. The National Park Service distinguishes these two programs by saying that the PWA was designed to spend, quote, big bucks on big projects. Tara, yes. If, you, if I, um, I want, I, if you don't mind, I'd like to interrupt you for a minute. Absolutely. We did have a question, and it was so funny. The question came in, and I had it written down as the same exact question to. Uh oh. Ask. I love that. So, um, uh, this is the question, and it was when you were speaking a little while back about Marybone Lake, and it. You said it went private. How does a how does a, a piece of land or this type of thing go private? Well, part of it um, was. Um, given up basically because there was really um, no no one to kind of oversee it. Nobody wanted to put any more money into it. So part of it is in state management now, um, but it was for a while, it was built on private land initially. And um, so I think sometimes we, we don't think about that. Um, I know here at Cumberland, we've been given some gifts with no money for the future. Um, you know, what, what do you do with things when you can't afford to keep, keep them up? Or um, that happens a lot to not just private institutions or museums, but also to governments. Um, people are like, well, I'll, I'll donate my house and it'll become a museum, but they don't give any money for the museum kind of thing. Um, so part of it is in state management now, but it was initially developed on private land. So it was, it was private. Um, and that was part of the controversy. Um, Harry Berry was not one to shy away from controversies. Um, and that would be part of the interesting part of a book, I think, is to talk about Harry Berry and um, things that happened at Warner Parks, things that happened at Maribone Lake, that he was really interested in sometimes helping the, the good old boy network in a lot of ways, helping out his friends when he could. When he could. So just so I'm clear, so it was built on private land and then they couldn't afford to keep it up. So they did it revert back to the people, the people who had originally owned it, or they put it up for sale. Like, I think that? that's the way it happened, um, and then it was sold, and then the state purchased it as kind of recreational um, managed care land. Um, and I'm not 100% sure. I'd have to go back and look at kind of land the land deeds and things like that. But that was again part of the controversy: is do we use federal funds on private land? I don't know that that's the best use of the funds those kinds of things. So um, I will, also, often, yeah, go ahead. I was just wondering how often does that happen? That, you know, is this like kind of just a very rare thing that happens where it be, where they can't take care of something. So then they, do they put it up for sale or it becomes public? Like, yeah, just I'm kind of, that really struck me. Like where, well, what happened? In Nashville, I think you could look at things like the Ben West library, you know, and this is not, I'm getting off from the new deal now, but you know, that land was donated to the city for the use for a library. And the, the initial Carnegie library had been built there. And then they tore that down and built the Ben West library in downtown Nashville. And then once the new library, and I say the new library, the current existing downtown branch of the Nashville public library was built then there was no use and need for the Ben West Library. And it was used as city offices for a little while. 
But then the city was like, we don't need this land. Let's sell the land and we don't have to maintain the building. But there was a deed restriction that the, the land had been given to the city specifically for the use of a library. And so kind of how, what do you do with that? Does it then revert back to the heirs of the original donor? Um, so I do think that that happens probably a lot more than we think about. Um, in particular, during the New Deal, I don't want to create Harry Berry as kind of this villain because I think he was just doing what everybody else was doing. The federal government was just throwing money at states. It had to be spent or it was going to go away. And so just trying to find ways to spend the money um, on projects that would benefit somebody and anybody. Um, we see that happen a lot, particularly during the New Deal. And that's one of the biggest criticisms of the New Deal is that there was in some instances very little oversight by anybody. It was just how fast can we hire people? How fast can we get money into people's hands? And it doesn't really matter necessarily if they who was checking to see if they were really unemployed or those kinds of things. So um, I think I think the, the emergency spending of the New Deal left a lot of oversight to be, to, to be desired for, in, for sure. Um, Maribone Lake is probably one of the very smallest examples of kind of some of the larger controversies that happened. But I don't know if I answered your question at all. Insightful, <laughs> yes. And um, yeah, it's just a whole other kind of like off swing of what your conversation today, but it you know was striking when you when you were talking about that. Apparently, I wasn't the only one going what. Sure, you know? what, what's so going like, on here? Yeah, <laughs> there is the intersection of private and public, and how does that all work together? And you, so, um, so yeah. So thank you. I didn't mean to, I, I hate to interrupt you, but it was. No, just that's like, great. That's great. Okay, so go ahead. Back. All to right. The I'm going to turn to the Public Works Administration <laughs> then. Um, this idea of big bucks on big projects, and that's kind of, that's something that has always stuck with me is um, when I look at what the PWA did um, in comparison to the WPA. And it's really like comparing apples and oranges because they had two very different um, goals. The goal of the WPA was to put people to work, get people jobs so they can have money to, to care for their families. The WPA wanted to do that, but they were mainly concerned with the infrastructure of the United States. We see a lot of PWA work in infrastructure things that we don't think about, things like roads, um, not interstates, but highways and things like that, that are kind of hard to take pretty pictures of or to think about, but they also did a lot of work in architectural buildings that you all will all recognize, I am sure. And these were all projects um, in many cases that had been kind of planned for, but then the depression hit. And so everything was put on the back burner. Um, that happens in government all the time. I could talk about the 2010 flood in Nashville and what kinds of projects we had been working on that had to be put on the back burner that still haven't been done as of yet. So the first building I want to look at when we talk about the PWA is one that is probably familiar to many of you. Um, this is on Broadway in downtown Nashville. Um, this was the United States Post Office, um, constructed initially in 1932 and 33. So pre the New Deal, pre the, the PWA, funded initially under the Treasury Department and constructed by a local architecture firm, Marin Holman, um, the building had been financed by the U.S. Treasury Department's Office of Construction. But this building is one of the best examples, not just in Tennessee, but I would say nationally, of the architectural style of the period, which is often called stripped classicism, starved classicism, sometimes we would call it um, depression classicism, kind of taking this idea of a classical building um, using some more modern designs, Art Deco design, but because of the Great Depression, taking off some of the ornamentation. So during the Depression, federal architects, architects working for the federal government, were expected to express certain um, ideals, the idea of permanence, of stability, of order, these kinds of values that were very important to Americans during the depression. Um, but to streamline this architecture so as to maybe demonstrate that the federal government's not wasting a bunch of money, at least during the depression. However, 
during the New Deal, we are going to see more and more of this money needing to be spent to employ more and more people. So we do get some more um, architectural design qualities, particularly on the insides of these buildings. And this post office in Nashville provides a model for much of what the, the WP, excuse me, I did it myself, the PWA is going to do, not just in Nashville, but again, nationally. Um, if you've been to Chattanooga, the Chattanooga post office and courthouse, which is still there today, is very similar to this building in style as well. Now, most of you probably know that this building is now the Frist Center for the Visual Arts or the Frist Art Museum. I think they've changed their name officially to the Frist Art Museum. Um, Tuck Kenton Architects, um, Seed Tuck in particular, worked very hard, particularly on the interior of this building, to maintain this historic feel. You can definitely still feel that it was a post office. Um, the Frist itself is very, very proud of their architectural history and their architectural legacy. Um, and actually, they're getting ready to this year celebrate their 20th anniversary. They've got a catalog and exhibition that is I don't know if it's opened yet, but it's opening this year called A Landmark Repurposed. Um, and actually, I've signed up for a Zoom lecture with the Frist on Thursday um, to, that's going to look at some of the architectural legacy and the idea of repurposing this building for its 21st century use. Um, again, not technically a New Deal building, but definitely a model for what was to come in Nashville and one of my favorite buildings in Nashville. Um, the PWA did do a lot of post office all over the country. Um, in Davidson County, the only other extant post office is this little tiny brick um, Colonial Revival post office up in my neck of the woods in Old Hickory. Um, Old Hickory, which I could do a whole nother hour on the history of Old Hickory if we ever want to do that sometime. Um, but Old Hickory was a company town um, it was pretty much owned by the DuPont plant. Um, they owned the worker housing and the um, PWA went into the Old Hickory area to build this little post office um, for the thousands of people who lived up in the Hadley's Bend area. Um, this post office still exists today. It is still the post office for the 37138 zip code. And it looks very much like it did when it was built in the 1930s. Um, it is very, very similar to other PWA post office built all over the country. If you've been in any of these small town post offices, it feels very, very familiar. Um, it feels very familiar to the post office I grew up going to over in McMinnville, for example. Um, just, they all kind of have the same feel and identity. So one of the things I like to look at in Nashville for the PWA is the fact that they funded government projects for the federal government, like the post office, um, and for state government as well as local government. So if we shift to looking at what the PWA did for state government, we look at another um, Nashville landmark, which is now called the John Sevier State Office Building. When it was constructed in the 1930s, it was just called the Tennessee State Office Building, which is what's written across the top of the building. It's hard to see, I think, in this slide, but it does say the Tennessee State Office Building. Um, this is a grand example of this stripped classicism, or sometimes we call it the PWA modern style. Again, designed by local architect Emmons Woolwine. And it's interesting how this building addresses the corner rather than the street. So it's looking at the corner um, instead of being lined up parallel with the street. The building was dedicated in 1940 and this is the crowd that came out to the dedication. And here, I think you can see better the, the Tennessee State Office Building written across the top of the building. Um, this is a picture from the Tennessee State Library and Archives. Now, this is a great building to look at, but even better is to go inside. And after 9-11 happened, our state buildings became a lot, lot harder to get into just to kind of be the general public to go walk around and look at them. But this building, the Sphere State Office Building, has some of the best New Deal murals in all of Nashville. 
And the murals are one of those things that have been really studied across the nation, but I don't think we give them any or enough um, highlights in Nashville in particular. The PWA worked very closely with the WPA Federal Artist Project. Um, again, this is the depression. People aren't giving commissions to artists. It's the federal government that's giving commissions to artists to put them to work, to pay them to paint something. Um, it's not just paintings and murals. There's also sculpture um, and other kinds of artistic pieces around the nation that we can look at. Um, there are two very impressive murals in the lobby of um, the Sevier State Office Building. Um, one is kind of the history of the nation and one is about the history of Tennessee. So here you see Andrew Jackson in the center um, of this painting with other scenes of Tennessee history kind of being going on around him. Um, this is the other mural on the other wall, George Washington in the middle, again, American history going on around him. But in addition to Dean Cornwall, who was the muralist here at the Spear Office Building, we also get sculptor Renee Chamblain, who did the massive bronze doors for this building. And these doors represent different offices that were to be housed in the building. Um, a lot of these offices are no longer there. This is um, conservation. I don't know if you can read that in this, in this image. Um, and then the, the three stars um, signifying the state of Tennessee above that. Again, if you're ever downtown and wander around this building, it's really, really an incredible piece of New Deal architecture. Um, very near to this building, basically across the street, is the Tennessee State Supreme Court building, another example of this idea of PWA modern style. Um, once you start looking at them, they're very similar in architectural style. This was Tennessee's first Supreme Court building. Now the Supreme Court had been housed in lots of different other buildings in Nashville, but this was the first time they had their own building. Um, they had met in the Davidson County Courthouse. They had a room in the state capitol until this building was constructed in the 1930s. Again, local architects, Marn Holman in this case, are the architects for this building. And again, the interior of this building is really, really glamorous, I think. Um, it has this beautiful terrazzo floor with the seal of the state Supreme Court in the floor. It has aluminum grill work in the entryway. It has these great Art Deco lights um, throughout the lobby of this building. And again, this is another building that if you can get into it, it's really glorious. And some of the offices in this building are also really interesting to look at. And then another project of the PWA is the construction of Nashville's airport called Berry Field. This was one of the PWA's ma first major projects in the state, constructing a terminal building of three stories, a control tower, and the first paved runway in Nashville. Now Nashville had had other airports. I mentioned McCabe Golf Course was at the site of what had been McConnell Field. There had also been a short-lived airport on the property of the Hermitage, again, out in my neck of the woods. But this is the first time that Nashville's getting a true modern airport. And part of that legacy we still have today. That's why Nashville's call letters are BNA, Berry Field, Nashville. It's a little piece of trivia that sometimes people, especially non-Nashvillians wonder, why is there a B in our Nashville airport call sign? Um, it's for Berry Field. So here's some photos of the construction um, in 1937 of this first terminal building um, dedicated in, in 1937. But besides those federal and state projects, the PWA also worked on local projects. Um, and here's another one of my favorite Nashville buildings. I did a lot of work in this building and on this building when I worked for the Historical Commission. And this is the Davidson County Public Building and Courthouse. And that was the official name of the building. Again, PWA modern style, a little bit different, a little more of that stripped classicism going on here. Um, lots of art deco detailing inside and out. And again, we've got local architect Edwin Woolwine working on this building. 
And I keep saying local architect, and local, local firms, because that was a big deal is to get these local architects to work instead of just hiring federal architects to go all over the country. They're again, trying to employ as many people as possible. There was a national design competition for this building. And so it did not necessarily have to go to a local architect, but Edwin Woolwine won the competition and his building was constructed. This building received a lot of national attention, particularly in the architectural field. It was featured in many architectural magazines and professional journals during the 1930s. And like at the Sevier State Office Building, Dean Cornwell and Renee Shamblain come to Nashville to do interior and exterior mural work and sculpture. Again, massive bronze doors on the front um, with these features. And then on the interior, if you've ever been in the courthouse, you've seen these murals. Um, this is again, um, apparently Andrew Jackson was one of Cornwall's favorite kind of models. He, we see him again here in the local, in the courthouse, as well as at the Sevier State Office Building. And another lesser known building local building is what we now call the Ben West building, which was constructed as the Nashville market, um, the city market, which we would now call the farmer's market, which of course is in a different building now. Um, the public square had traditionally been home to the farmer's market, the city market, since the founding of Nashville. Um, this new market in the 1930s um, featured air conditioning and refrigeration areas, which was extremely modern for the 1930s. Um, it was a great addition for those people who were coming in to Nashville um, from the more rural areas of Davidson County to sell produce and things like that. Um, I love, love, love this old picture of the, what we call the Ben West building. It shows those vaulted ceilings. A lot of that was lost when the farmer's market moved out and the Ben West building was converted into office space, but the building is still there today and is still in use by the city of Nashville. And then together, the PWA and the WPA worked on infrastructure. I mentioned this idea of roads. Other projects included things like sewers. These are a lot of hard to get a hold of when you're talking about um, the WPA and the PWA. People don't really want to talk about building the sewers or building roads. That's not glamorous. But I do like to include the public works garages up at Rolling Mill Hill um, because part of what the WPA did was take up all of the streetcar rails in the city of Nashville. Nashville had had a long standing streetcar line, which was removed in the 1930s, and the roads were then repaved because of the large uptick in personal car ownership and just vehicular traffic on Nashville roads. I know that comes as a surprise to many of you that Nashville had traffic problems in the 1930s because Nashville has never had traffic problems. But the WPA is also working to pave these roads to do what we just talked about with the city market, bringing in these farmers into town. We need to improve the roads so they can get to town um, in a, what they call the farm to market program. The public works garages up at Rolling Mill Hill are where much of this equipment was housed to build and improve Nashville's roads. Um, they've become known as the trolley barns and that name is a misnomer, although a lot of people like think it's much more sexy than public works garages. That's what they were. They never housed trolleys, at least in our research at the Metro Historical Commission was able to determine. Um, they were really built after Nashville had streetcars and not built to house trolleys. That's a great thing to get into arguments with people all the time. They're like, well, we're going to go over to the trolley barns. And I'm like, no, they're not the trolley barns. And then people are like, you're just a big nerd and stop talking about it. But I am a New Deal historian and I like to get things right. But the trolley barns are a great historic preservation project in Nashville, um, regardless of what we're going to call them, because we could have easily lost these buildings and these reminders of all of those laborers, all of those hardworking men who worked throughout the 1930s in particular to improve Nashville's roads. So I'm really, really proud of what had been done in this project, even if they call them by the wrong name. I'll just leave it at that. But. 
And then I mentioned that the WPA, like the PW, the PWA, like the WPA, also worked on many of Nashville schools. Um, and again, these are Nashville city schools as opposed to Davidson County schools, which for us in the 21st century doesn't, there's no distinction because they're all metro. But in the 1930s, there was a distinction. And the city of Nashville's schools were in deplorable conditions in the late 1920s and into the 1930s. There was a lot of deferred maintenance. We think things are bad today. It was much, much worse 100 years ago. Um, several studies had been done to try to figure out what was going on in Nashville, how to get the schools up to better standards and better conditions. Nashville simply didn't have the money to do anything with their school buildings or their educational programming. But thanks to the New Deal, there was a great influx of funds that allowed not just the buildings themselves to be improved, but also kind of the educational programming to be improved. The PWA built a lot of elementary schools in Nashville, including Lockland Elementary and Aiken School, both of which are still in existence today. Um, these were targeted for these growing kind of second and third ring suburban communities in Nashville that had really grown because of the streetcar lines, but were now um, continue that growth and population was continuing. I mentioned at the very beginning, East Junior High School, which was constructed next to East High School. Um, architect George Waller built the school in a very similar style to go along with the high school. Um, and then West End High School, which is probably the premier of the PWA schools in Nashville, designed again, local architect, this is Donald Southgate. Um, and this school also included a football field constructed by the WPA. So here we're seeing kind of the, the work of both PWA and WPA. Um, West End High School was a very popular high school when it opened. Um, during its first year, it was discovered that about 250 students had enrolled as high school students that lived outside the zone, just because everybody wanted to go to the new modern high school in Nashville. Another high school that was built um, with PWA funding is Pearl High School, which is now Martin Luther King. And these three schools have very different architectural styles. We've got Colonial Revival at West End, we've got Gothic Revival at East, and we've got a very stripped classic Art Deco style at what was then Pearl High School, now Martin Luther King Magnet. Interestingly, if you look at the floor plans of these three schools, and I'm gonna go back so you can kind of see how they're laid out with this central opening and then wings on either side, they're all laid out very similarly. The interiors of these schools are very similar. It's the exterior ornamentation that makes them very different. Um, the PWA standardized school plans. They're not just throwing money and saying, build whatever you want. It's like, here's some money, here's some plans, choose what works for you. And so the this, school standardization means that a lot of these PWI high schools, again, across the nation, feel very similar once you go inside of them. Um, so these schools, all three of these schools are still in use. Um, they're all listed in the National Register of Historic Places, and all of these schools are very proud of their historic legacy. Um, the PWA did construct, as I said, Pearl High School, as well as Cameron School. These were in the 1930s constructed as segregated schools for the African-American community in Nashville. Cameron was constructed in 1939 and 1940 and replaced an earlier school that had the same name. And in 1940, it opened as an elementary and middle school, um, grades one through eight or maybe one through nine. And then the students would leave Cameron and go to Pearl High School for their high school education. Pearl High School is distinctive because, again, we're talking about local architects, but in this case, African-American architects, um, the firm McKissick & McKissick, which is still a rather famous African-American architectural firm, no longer headquartered in Nashville. I believe they're headquartered in Washington, D.C. now. But Pearl High School was regarded as potentially the most modern high school for African-Americans anywhere in the South in the decade of the 1930s. Um, and again, still, both of these are still in use and listed in the National Register of Historic Preservation. 
Um, I'm going to get ready to wind up here because I feel like I've talked for a long time, but I can't let my discussion of the PWA go by without talking a little bit about public housing. Um, this is another major achievement of the New Deal, um, both architecturally as well as in the idea of social services, the development of urban public housing. Uh, Memphis and Nashville were two cities selected for demonstration projects, um, kind of um, the guinea pigs for in the days pre-urban renewal, but for providing modern housing for the poor. Um, each city, both Memphis and Nashville, developed two public housing pro projects. Why two? Segregation, one for whites, one for blacks. Um, these public housing projects um, to appeal to low income families that lived in what was considered substandard housing. No running water, no electricity, for example. Um, these public housing projects had landscaped grounds, recreational facilities, libraries, community meeting rooms, and even provided daycare for the residents. Um, and for many of the families that lived in both Cheatham Place and at Andrew Jackson Courts, Cheatham Place for whites, Andrew Jackson Courts for African Americans, um, this was the first time many of these families ever had these, what we would consider necessities, running water, flushing toilets, electricity, Cheatham Place is Nashville's first earliest public housing project. Um, and they both, both of these still serve as public housing in Nashville today. Um, this is the beginning of the United States Housing Authority and this idea of federally funded public housing projects. So whatever you think of public housing today, um, in the 1930s, this was a great step up for many of these families. Um, Again, these programs are now administered by um, the Metropolitan Development and Housing Authority. Um, in particular, Cheatham Place is just beautiful if you walk through that area. Um, again, the landscaping, sidewalks, um, they have not been maintained as well as one would like, either of them, but they both still have been serving a purpose um, for Nashville's families. I have, uh, excuse me, I have a quick question about yeah. this. I'm glad you brought this up because it was on my mind earlier, I believe you showed some of these photos in the beginning. Um, uh, so now that Nashville is just gentrifying like crazy and becoming a, you know, really incredibly like expansive and almost out of reach economic city for so many people who live here. Um, what, and, and, and are, are any of these housing, like are they get people who, are people who can't afford housing now getting displaced? And what, are the, what is happening with all of that? You know, what's happening with the people now who can't there? I know from an, I know I do curate the art galleries. I know there's a lot of artists who have trouble now affording housing. Everybody's getting pushed further and further out of um, Nashville. And, but how about all these people who are in these projects and these homes that may be, these areas are getting gentrified. Are they going to knock them down? Like, and then move people? Like what's happening with that? That is a much larger issue and larger discussion. Um, and I, I can't say a whole lot about what's happening in 2021, just because I, I'm not there anymore. I'm not privy to a lot of the day-to-day -day discussions that I, you know, when I worked for the Historical Commission and worked with MDHA on a daily um, basis. Um, but we, you know, but then that's a problem that has been going on in Nashville um, for decades, really, since the 90s. Uh, it's getting much worse, obviously. It's exponentially worse than it has ever been with housing prices and um, a shortage or a perceived shortage of housing stock. Um, I know there's a definite shortage of affordable housing. For these two projects, um, because of their historic nature, there are federal um, laws and guidelines about what people like MDHA can and can't do because there are federal guidelines about what federal money can be spent on um, and knocking down historic buildings is not something that the federal government is going to look kindly to in a lot of ways. Now, there's lots of examples of that happening in other ways, but um, there is a process that would have to go through. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it is a lengthy bureaucratic process. Now, if projects, um, if they're looking at um, 
housing stock that is either not federally controlled or has federal money going into it, that's a whole different um, ball of wax. Individual developers have a lot less um, red tape to go through than state, local, and federal government projects. So that's a whole different thing, this idea of gentrification and going into um, not even necessarily low income neighborhoods, um, but traditionally minority neighborhoods that have, have seen their culture change dramatically, mm -hmm. um, things like that. Particularly in kind of North Nashville, I think we're really seeing that happen today. We, but that's just an offshoot of what happened in East Nashville in the 80s and 90s. Right. When that area was, um, some say saved and some say gentrified. So it just, mm. it's, it's definitely an issue. Um, again, not just in Nashville, but in particular, Nashville's really, really seeing it. Um, and yeah. I, I don't know what the answer is. Um, yeah. So as long as people want to be in the it city, people will spend more money than buildings are probably really worth. But right. on that note, <laughs> yay, happiness. Um, but yeah, let, let me conclude real quick. And then we conclude. Have this has been really and so informative and fascinating um, to learn of all the buildings. I, I didn't realize all the buildings. And yeah, so thank you. Go ahead. Well, I just, I think, and this is kind of how I conclude is that I think most people in Nashville kind of realize that history is all around us. Um, maybe that's country music history. Maybe it's places like Bellmead Mansion or Cheekwood or the Hermitage where we know, you know, big people lived. Um, but I think what the New Deal speaks to really is not presidents and governors and the, the re really rich, but it's to the everyday people, the people that built these things, that made these things happen. Um, the students in these schools um, and the workers, in particular the laborers, I, I love um, going out to Warner Parks and thinking about those, those men that built those picnic shelters that we still enjoy. Um, I've been to more than one graduation party or wedding reception out there and I just, I love Warner Parks. Um, but I think to me, the New Deal architecture is where we can look at that Nashville, the real Nashville lived, worked, studied and played and that all of those things are still happening in most of those buildings, um, most, of, most of the buildings that are extant today. And really, we've got a lot left, which is amazing to me, especially the rate of development Nashville's seen in the last 20 years. So hopefully when you're driving around and you see these buildings, maybe you'll get a little different appreciation for what, what went into them. Um, but that's, that's kind of all I have to say, but I'm glad to answer any questions or have any kinds of discussions as long as I can get to my class in a few minutes. <laughs> yeah, well, we, don't, we, didn't, we don't have any more questions. Okay. And, um, and, if, and if we do, we can take emails and send them to Absolutely. you. Absolutely. And that happens. So thank you so much. This is so informative and interesting. And really there were more buildings than I actually uh, realized as well. And I learned so much and I hope our audience did as well. And well, mm -hmm. we'd, love to, we'd love to have you back and, um, and thank you again for your time and your expertise. All right. Well, thank you all so much. I really enjoyed being with you. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.